In the last diocese where I served in Chelmsford, one of my pieces of ministry for the church was teaching our licensed lay readers, people who had uh, been selected by their churches to be lay people who preached the gospel, teaching them how to study and how to interpret texts and how to preach. Having listened to me preach you now for five weeks, you may consider me wholly unqualified for this task, but I was chosen for it nonetheless, and as a man obedient to his bishop, I duly did it. And part of the course that I taught these lay readers uh, was a little bit of New Testament Greek. We had one week to cover the entirety of New Testament Greek. And I decided that it would be foolish to try and teach them uh, even a few words in that time, but what I thought might be useful was to teach them New Testament Greek for the person who reads not a word of New Testament Greek. The idea was that I would teach them how to use uh, resources written in English to explore the Greek text. And we do a worked example each time this week came up, and I let them pick it so they didn't feel like I'd prepared it all in advance and I just got a really easy and juicy one. And sometimes that worked very well, and sometimes it worked less well. There was one week when uh, one of the women who was there wanted to explore the, the word for bread. The word is um, artos in Greek. She said that she'd always thought that there, there must be something to uncover in the way that Jesus tells his disciples to pray for daily bread. There must be some exploration to do to discover more about bread as a Eucharistic element. Well, the combined might of the Greek lexicons that we looked at offered the following. Artos, noun, masculine, bread, a loaf of unknown origin. Other choices worked out much better, and none more so than the time that a woman wanted to look up the word glory. The word is uh, doxa, from which we get things like doxology, the name that we give to glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Doxa. And glory means the things you probably think it means. It means uh, renown and honour and splendour. But it has another meaning as well that doesn't so immediately come to mind. And it's this. It means inherent, intrinsic worth. A thing's glory is its inherent, intrinsic worth. And it's nuggets like that that make the whole boring bit of studying worthwhile, and I'll explain why. The transfiguration that we're celebrating today is a story all about glory. We see Jesus glorified, his face glowing white, and indeed, his entire raiment, his entire clothing glowing white. And this is a, a classic um, biblical type. We see lots of people uh, glowing white in the Bible. Um, Moses, notably, when he comes down from the mount, having received the tablets. There's another interesting uh, thing about words here, uh, and the danger of getting them not quite right. Uh, when Jerome was translating the Vulgate in uh, the fourth century, he mistranslated the word for uh, shining. So Moses comes down with a shining face, a glowing face. He mistranslated that for the word horned. And um, if you look at our stained glass windows at the back of this church, uh, the two in the middle up there, as you're looking at them now, the one on the left has Moses holding two tablets, the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. It's uh, one, two, three down on the left of the central pair. And you'll see protruding from his head two bright yellow horns. And indeed, if you look at um, other images of him in that same start, stained glass window, smaller ones, he's also horned. Uh, that was a mistake that Jerome made in the fourth century, and it's haunted the church um, ever since. Uh, Michelangelo's uh, Moses has got horns. Um, even Wycliffe's first uh, English Bible had Moses coming down from the mountain with horns. And Jerome should have known better, really, because uh, the other instances of glory that are displayed in the Bible, that of angels, are shown to be uh, shiny, not horny, and the same too with Stephen, 
when he is stoned. It says his face shone like the sun. But Jerome didn't pick up on that one, and so we had a horned Moses and not a shining-faced Moses. But the point for Jesus at his transfiguration is that it's not just his face that glows, like it does with Moses. I imagine for Moses it's a kind of reflection of God's glory. It's like when you've been um, out in the sun for way too long, and in the evening you come in, and even though the sun's gone down, you can still feel your face pulsating as the, the rays of heat continue to radiate off it. But for Jesus, his entire body glows, his clothes glow, because he is the source of that glory. He's not simply reflecting the glory fallen upon him from God, but the glory is emanating from him. And when the disciples see Jesus shining in his glory, yes, they see him in his honor and his renown and his splendor, but remember what else glory means. They see him in his inherent intrinsic worth. When something is glorified, things aren't added to it to make it better, but almost the opposite happens. It's stripped away of all the things that are not good about it. The cracks aren't just papered over, but rather the rough outer skin is removed to reveal the beauty that's beneath. And in that way, glorification is a process of revelation. It's about revealing the very best of what a thing can be. When something is glorified, it's revealed in its perfect state, in the way in which God first created it when he made it and saw that it was good. So what on earth happens when you glorify God? What can that mean? God is surely always good. There's nothing wrong to strip away. Well, what you get when you reveal God's inherent intrinsic worth, when you glorify God, is precisely what happened at the transfiguration. God in Jesus Christ is glorified, and the result is extraordinary. The glory of God, it turns out, is a human fully alive. When God reveals to the disciples the glorified Jesus, they see a human. Sure, a rather unusual one, with a shining face, with his whole body alight and glistering, as the wonderful translation in the King James has it. But they see, nonetheless, a recognizable human. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. It means that we look like God, and remarkably, therefore, God looks a bit like us. Each one of us, stripped of all of our sin, each one of us, when we have been revealed, when we have been glorified, when our inherent intrinsic worth has been shown, resembles the divine. Just as the glorified Christ still resembles a human. That is the potential within each one of us created in God's image. And what I want to leave you with is one rather more practical point, which is the context in which this all happens. The transfiguration occurs in the context of prayer. Jesus has gone to the top of the mountain to pray. And so many encounters with God in the Gospels occur in the context of prayer. Following his baptism, the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus while he is praying. Jesus' selection of the twelve apostles occurs while he is praying. Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah occurs while they are gathered praying. We meet with God when we pray together and when we pray alone. And you can come and pray with us each morning at 8 and each evening at 5.30. You can start coming tomorrow. Or you can sit down with your family. Or you can get up five minutes earlier in the morning and carve out time to spend in prayer witnessing the glorification of God.
It's in our prayer that we're glorified, that our inherent intrinsic worth is revealed, that our sin is stripped away, and that we become the people that God intended us to be. Amen.